Hi, everybody. We'll we'll get started in just a minute here. I see um, the attendees are signing in here real quick. So give us another 30 seconds or so. Okay, it looks like most of the attendees are in. So uh, my name is Rich Paul. I'm the uh, state exec in Illinois and Kansas, and um, we're happy to um, uh, welcome you to today's um, Medicare encoding webinar. Um, I'm uh, happy to acknowledge our partners also today, uh, the New York State um, Ophthalmological Society and Robin Pellegrino, their exec, Colleen Filbert, who is our fearless um, behind the scenes magician uh, managing the Zoom today. She's from Florida. And Debbie Osborne from Connecticut is also on board with us. So without any further ado, um, I will go ahead and um, introduce our expert for today. Well, she's actually an expert every day, I think, but uh, she's our expert today. Uh, Jackie Thelian, uh, she's a healthcare consultant, a certified professional coder, auditor, uh, she's a subject man, uh, expert um, with 20 years of experience in Medicare coding, business management, and physician practice management. Um, if you look at her uh, bio, there's a whole bunch of letters after her name, which um, I'm sure means that she's studied a lot and taken a lot of tests. So um, uh, we're glad to have you, Jackie. Um, she's uh, spoken for all of our state societies in the past and has always had very um, positive reviews from the attendees. And I know that she has a lot of information to share with us today. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Jackie. Take thank it you, away. Rich. Hi, and thank you everybody for having me here today. Um, we do have a very robust and uh, jam-packed presentation. So what I plan to do is I'm gonna open up for questions after various sections of the PowerPoint, but I will be mindful of the time. So if I see we're, we're running a little bit short, then I'll ask you to um, hold your questions till the end. I'm going to take myself off video because I'd rather have you focus on the presentation than myself. So here we go. All right, so our agenda for today, it's um, pretty busy. We're gonna talk about updates to the physician fee schedule. And most importantly, we wanna understand how that fee schedule works. Because I find that sometimes um, providers will say, well, you know, I didn't hear that there were any changes to the fee schedule. But you know, you have to understand if a conversion factor changes or if a relative value of the code itself changes. As you'll see as we go through the presentation, that's going to have an impact on your reimbursement. Um, so we're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk about some updates that include changes to the split shared visits and the updated rules and regs on how physician assistants can now bill for their services. So a lot of changes there. Not too many changes in the 2022 uh, code set for ophthalmology. Some of the changes are either a revised information in the guidelines or perhaps the parentheticals have changed, but we do have a lot of new category three codes that we can go over. Well, we're not gonna get into the specifics today on the new ICD-10 codes, which were issued last year in October. I do wanna address the guideline changes because that's impacting a lot of providers um, with regards to unspecified diagnosis codes and claim denials. So we've seen a lot of that coming in, as well as providers who are using unspecified codes getting on the radar screen for audits. Since there's a lot of questions regarding the 2021 E&M documentation guidelines, uh, the AMA has made a couple of updates. So we're gonna provide a refresher on how and when to use time to determine the level of service and how the calculation is very different than it was for the 1995 or 1997 levels of service. We're gonna talk about social determinants of health 
And although this speaks to your ICD-10 coding, it's addressed in the E&M guidelines and it does impact the level of risk. So it's worth an in-depth look into these new diagnosis codes. Some of you may use them. It really is going to depend upon the uh, location of where you're providing services and your patient population. Uh, a little bit of a refresher on the I codes versus the E&M. And since I've been receiving a lot of questions regarding modifiers and a lot of audits have been coming in for modifiers or the misuse of modifiers, I want to address the more common modifiers uh, for which insurers have been asking for refunds from the physicians and mostly the inappropriate use of modifier 50. I think a lot of uh, providers still don't understand you know, how to bill for it and how it impacts the reimbursement. Okay, so first we're going to start to look at some of the new changes. Um, the RVS Update Committee, which is known as RUC, uh, these are the folks, they were a volunteer group of about 32 physicians and other healthcare professionals, and they advise Medicare on how to value the physician's work. So what we want to do is we want to show you, you know, what's going to impact your reimbursement. So here, obviously, we have facility coding. It could be a national amount, or it could be global, which is your locality. So Medicare will come out with the national fee schedule, and then the max at the local levels, the localities, will modify the fee, the amount, based upon the geographic factor or the geographical area where that service is taking place. Uh, the fee schedule also tells us if a certain code has a uh, professional or a technical component to it. And the code, each CPT code, is broken up into various components. How much is the work value, right? What is, what is the work of the physician valued for this particular code? And this is based upon the RUC committee. So those 32 physicians and other healthcare professionals get together, they discuss the work that's done for you know, these particular CPT codes, and they come up with a value. That value then gets presented to Medicare, and Medicare will either accept it or change it. And they could change it up or they can change it down. But one of the key components is the work or the RVU. The PE is your practice expense, right? So how much does it cost for your light, your heat, your power, your staff? So this gets assigned. A number and then how much does the malpractice cost and this gives you your total RVU so if the RUC committee changes the work RVU definitely it's going to impact your reimbursement either up or down and then we have a conversion factor the conversion factor is the multiplier that Medicare applies to that relative value to calculate the reimbursement for a particular service or procedure. And then Medicare system adjusts the fee for service payment rates for hospitals and practitioners according to that geographic location. So you could see over here, right? Recognizing that certain costs will vary depending upon if the service is done in a metropolitan area or let's say by a different region. So here's the link that you could go to, and I, I recommend that everybody goes here for the fee schedule. There are different ways that you can look up the fees. So once you click on that link, this is what you'll see. You can search the physician fee schedule. You can get your fee schedule for the entire year with all information, or you could get your fee schedule for the entire year with limited amount of information and you'll see what that difference is in just a moment. But as I mentioned, you can get the entire fee schedule and you're gonna get all this information. And that's really important because also when providers are looking at selling their practice or joining a hospital, the hospital will manage or determine what your work RVU is, right? Based upon all the codes that you build. So this is where the information comes from. Each CPT code has a work RVU, right? So if we were to search the year 2022, you can type for all information, 
or you could ask just for billing information or just for modifier information. You can look at one CPT or HCPCS code or multiple CPTs or HCPCS codes. So here I put in the 67311. I want to see the modifiers. And here you can select your MAC or your Medicare Administrator Contractor. And those are the folks who process the claims in your jurisdiction. This is what you'll get. I had to break it up into bits, but it's a big Excel spreadsheet. So you get a worth of a, a full amount of information. You'll get the code. You could get the modifiers that are applicable to that code. You get a short description. You see your MAC locality, um, the non-facility fee, the facility practice, other things that are important. Here's your practice expense, right? Here's the work expense, uh, the work RVU. And when it comes down here, you could see what is the global price or the global days. This is 90 for global days. Is there a pre-op? Pre-op is 10, intra-op is 70, post-op is 20. So if you were splitting that global package, here's your splits for that particular code. This is really important. Here's your bilateral surgical uh, modifier. All of these indicators mean something and impact your reimbursement. And here's the conversion factor for this code. So it, it's worth looking into. I know lots of times providers just want to see, well, you know, here's the code. This is the amount of money that I'm getting paid. All well and good. But if you're using modifiers, you want to see, is there an assistant surgeon allowed for this? Is there a co-surgeon allowed for this? So you can have an assistant surgeon, but not a co-surgeon, right? What is the physician's supervision? So all of these numbers, all of this data impacts your reimbursement. So what are the changes this year to the codes that you um, provide most frequently? Well, glaucoma surgery, except for the aqueous shunts to an external reservoir, are decreased about 9%. Strabismus surgery has a decrease of about 20% and the 67312 by 10%. Cataract surgery has a decrease of about 4%. Why? Because the relative values have changed. So here, um, previous last year, the 67320 was valued at 540. The RUC committee came in and said, no, we're, you know, we're going to look at these uh, misvalued codes and we think it should be three. And CMS agreed with that. So you could see the decrease in most, with the exception of the 67335, where previously it was 2.46. Uh, the REC committee came in and valued it at 3.23, and CMS did agree with it. So there's a lot that goes into the fee schedule that's going to impact your reimbursement. So as I mentioned every year, it's good to download the complete fee schedule so you can see how that's going to um, impact your practice. A big change is split or shared visits. Don't confuse this with incident two setting. Okay, so to be clear, before we start talking about split shared visits, split shared visits are only applicable in the facility settings. All right, in the outpatient setting, you would use incident two. Split shared visits um, don't apply to the outpatient settings, and they're different regulations uh, this year versus next year. So here you also want to keep in mind the new 2021 um, documentation guidelines are not applicable to facility services. So when we're talking about these split share visits, think about services that happen in the hospital setting, your initials, your subsequents. Okay. And this slide is going to talk about what's going to change for 2022 for this year and what's going to change for 2023. So when we have a split shared visit, that visit is split in a facility setting between a physician and a non-physician professional. Think nurse practitioner, physician assistant. And these services could be billed out either by the physician or the NPP if furnished independently by only one of them. But payment now will be made to the practitioner who performs the substantive portion of the visit. These visits can be reported for new established patients initial subsequent visits, and for prolonged services. 
So I'm going to come down here for 2022. How do we define that substantive portion of the visit? It would be one of the three key components, the history, the physical, um, or the medical decision making, or more than half of the total time, except for critical care, which can only be more than half of the total time. So in this particular instance for this year, if um, I'm a physician and I send my PA or my nurse practitioner to the hospital to see the patient and they take care of, let's say, um, the history and the physical exam, which is typically what they would do, and then I'll come later that same day and I will review that information and I will do the medical decision making, okay? Um, the substantive portion is one of those three key components. So in this case, it's the medical decision making, which I did as the physician. I could build that under myself, okay? Um, if it was half of the total time, let's say the visit took 30 minutes, it was a time-based encounter, and I saw the patient for um, 18 minutes, I could build it under myself. That's for this year but next year it's going to change. And the substantive portion of the visit will then be defined as more than half of the total time spent by the physician and the NPP, whichever one is more. There's a new modifier that's effective this year. It's the FS modifier, and that's required on claims to identify that this was a split shared visit. And obviously the documentation must identify the two individuals who performed the visit and the individual who did the substantive portion must sign and date that medical record. Another change, and by the way, all this information comes out from the physician fee schedule. So aside from just dollars and cents and numbers, these are changes that you'll see in the physician fee schedule that can also impact how you practice and your reimbursement. Now this is interesting because now currently Medicare only makes payment to the employer or independent contractor for a physician assistant. And although Medicare is now allowing, right, they're authorizing Medicare to make direct payment to PAs for their professional services, uh, so they can now bill Medicare directly they can reassign payment for their professional services and they can incorporate with other PAs and bill Medicare for their services. Here, I just wanna put a little bit of a um, caveat or something to look out for. Check the New York state laws and any laws in your particular state. So here in New York, I'm not an attorney, but I'm told by some of the attorneys that this is all well and good for Medicare, but New York state law does not allow it. So check with your state rules and regs and laws before you jump on board with this to see or check with your healthcare attorney. Um, another notable change, this came out a little bit earlier on, uh, 2021 for, for this year. And I just wanna make sure anybody that's using an advanced beneficiary notice um, we'll make sure they have the most updated version. So I give you the links over here. There were a few changes in the ABN. And just as a refresher, you know, the ABNs, it's a notice that you would give the patient for a service that Medicare uh, may not pay for. Maybe it's overutilization, over the limitation, or maybe it's a service that Medicare statistically just doesn't reimburse. Uh, but the patient, and these again for Medicare patients only, you inform the patient that you feel it's in their best interest that they have the service. Uh, the cost of the service is noted in this ABN. And then the patient can make a educated decision about their health care and their finance. If they choose to go forward with it, fine. They can sign off on the ABN. Uh, you would bill that particular code with the appropriate modifier, a GA, a GY, a GX modifier. And that would um, tell Medicare that you have the ABN on file. And if it's a service that Medicare doesn't pay for whatever reason, whether it's limitation or it's just something they don't cover, that EOB will come back saying that it's the patient's responsibility. So 
you still need the ABNs. Um, a change in care is described if you're going to change the care. Uh, a change in the patient's health requiring a change in treatment or maybe a change in Medicare coverage policy for that item or service based upon what you had signed for the ABN. But the big deal is that uh, yearly updates for ABNs related to repeat or continuous services will no longer be necessary. So once you have it, you have it, unless there's one of these changes and this S should actually be an N. So new ABNs are still needed for any of these three reasons. I recommend you go online and check, see that you have the most updated version, and then you can also get the educational material uh, that speaks to it as well. So at this point, um, I'm going to look into my chat, and um, I'm going to pause here. If anybody has any questions, you can type them in. And one of the questions I have is, with the surgical modifiers, can we tell if, for example, a PA can assist us, and how will this be identified? That's a great question. And I'm just going to go back a couple of slides here so we can uh, address that. And you'll see here's the category for assistant surgeon. And the number here will designate whether you can have a surgeon assist or not. Okay, so this particular code actually uh, is listed as a number one. And um, here's for your team surgeon, if you're looking for that, and if you're looking for a co-surgeon. And once you download the fee schedule, you can get what each of these numbers mean at the bottom. Obviously, these are global days, uh, but you can take a look at um, the full fee schedule when you go to this link over here. So when you click on this link, you can, you're directed to this page. Here we go. But the page prior to this, if you just go back one, you can download, um, I don't want to call it a manual, like a guide to everything that's in there. So again, you know, it, this is really a, a wealth of information. I'm just checking the chat here. All right. Let's see. All right, so here's a good question. When a patient is co-managed, does it fall into the split shared uh, new modifier? The answer uh, is going to be no, but I'm going to define what I think you mean by co-managed. Co-managed um, is if you have two providers that are um, managing the patient's condition. The answer to that would be no. The split shared visits occur when the patient is being seen by a physician and a non-physician professional on the same day. So they're actually splitting the work of that visit. Um, Co-management to me thinks that there's maybe two different types of practitioners that are managing this particular patient. Uh, they could be of different specialties or maybe they're of the same specialties or subspecialties, but it doesn't speak to me that they're being uh, actually seen, examined and managed on that same day. So this is just when you're splitting that visit with um, a nurse practitioner or a PA or some other uh, non-physician professional. Okay, so now let's take a look at the new codes, the new CPT codes. And here we see um, the minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. And this over here is a code change. So they reviewed, the recommended reviewed the utilization of code 66174 and 65820, and that was by the REP committee. And they determined that um, the way these codes are reported should change. So here, the 66174, they, this is the new change. Anything that you see in green with these two uh, triangles, that's a change in information when you get your CPT manual. So they're telling you that they don't want you to report the 66174 in conjunction with the 65820, which is the goinotomy. Um, and they feel that the 65820 is an inherent or component part of the 66174, but they determined it is not a component part of the 66175. So this is another good example of when you get your manual, don't just look at the new codes and the deleted codes. 
you really want to take a look at what is changed or revised and that's important because you know when you have a change of code that you were used to reporting before which was fine may not be fine now and vice versa maybe a code that you were not reporting before you're now able to do so and here we're going to see how they value them so your 66174 which was previous at 12.85 the rec committee valued it at 8.53 and here we see a good example where CMS did not agree and they decided to make it 7.62 the same with the 66175 was previously valued at 13.60 rec gave it a 10.25 and CMS uh, finally valued it at the 9.34. When we look at our cataract um, code, the 66982, uh, the code itself, again, did not change, but the code has a new parenthetical. Again, we see those green triangles, the green language, and this is referring you to use CPT code 66. 989 for a complex extracapular cataract removal which is the new code for this year so we're going to take a look at that and by the way anything with a red dot in your CPT manual is going to tell you it's new here we see our parentheticals okay so it's a new combination code for your cataract IOL and minimally invasive glaucoma surgery with a MIGS device in the past, we had cataract code 66984 or 66982, and then we had a different code for the insertion of these devices. So those cataract codes remain the same when that's all you're doing. But we have the new code for the complex with the MIGS, and we have another one for regular cataract with MIGS device. And the new combination codes will apply whether one of these devices is used or more than one. So there's no longer the billing for the second device. And then we come down here and we see the category three code. And we know the category three codes are used for new and emerging technology. And the 0671T, the insertion of an anterior segment aqueous drainage device into the trabecular meshwork without the extraocular reservoir and with the co-contaminant cataract removal, one or more. So here again, a little um, warning. Be aware that the FDA approval for these devices all currently say with cataract surgery. So even if this code is correct, it might not have insurance coverage and end up being a patient pay. The code is also for one or more devices, and you cannot use the 0671T with the 66984, because uh, that code is now a 66991, as we see here. And importantly, the longstanding codes for the eye stent or the hydrus, the 0191T and the 0376T are both deleted, and you would no longer use or report those. Okay, another change here, you can see that we do have some change in the code descriptor itself, and this blue triangle means that we have a revision in the code, another key thing to look for in your CPT manual. So we have it for the 67141 and the 67145. And what we have here, because now we took out the language of one or more sessions, and here we took out the um, definition of laser, or Exxon Arc, and we see that the RUC committee changed the values. This was a big decrease. So the 67141 was previously valued at 6.15, and the RUC and CMS both agree at 2.53, and the 67145 uh, was valued at 6.32, and again, that's also valued at the um, 2.53. So with the removal of the one or more sessions from the code descriptor, this change allowed the procedure to be valued correctly as just one session. 
Okay, another new code that we see, and this code has new parentheticals. The 68841 is a new code this year, and previously this service was reported with the Category 3 code of 0356T. But utilization and literature requirements um, have all been met, and now they converted the Category 3 into a Category 1. So Category 1 are those billable codes, and also the, um, they're both billable codes, and um, I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought for a minute. The 68841 includes the instructional parenthetical note to report the code 99070 separately for the supply of the implant. Okay. The drug eluding implant insertion code, the 66841, this can be reported, notice it's for each, okay? So it's for each eye. And when the lacrimal count Panelist, drug eluding implant of both eyes is performed and you're coding the 68841, you would report that twice because the code descriptor says each. A cross-reference to these parentheticals have been added instructing the users to report 044T and 0445T for the placement of the drug eluding ocular insert under the eyelids. And here's how it was valued. Obviously, this is a new code, so we don't have any previous um, information. And this is valued at 0 0.49 from the RUC and CMS agreed. And that's really for the Category 1 codes. Um, category 1 codes are codes that are um, all billable codes. Category 3 codes can be billed. Again, that's for emerging technology, so the carriers can decide whether or not they choose to pay for it. Uh, codes will remain in Category 3 for a number of years until there's enough information to make a decision on the efficacy and the use of that particular code in which case it will either be moved into a Category 1 uh, CPT code, as we saw on the earlier slide, or it will just, um, they call it Sunrise, it, it will just be deleted. So here are the new ones. Um, so prior to 2022, the CPT code said we didn't have codes to describe the treatment of amblyopia using an online digital program. So the 0687T is for the initial session. That's for the setup. That's where the patient is being trained and the use of this management portal. The 0688T is reported for follow-up assessments after the patient had completed the at-home training sessions. Okay, and let me just see here. Okay, so that's it for the new, um, the new codes. Not too many changes in the CPT codes for um, 2022. Let's take a look at what we have with ICD-10. The big deal with ICD-10 this year, and as I mentioned, I'm not going into the new codes. Um, those came out in October, all right? So we, we should all be familiar with the new codes for that by now. But there's the general coding guidelines, and this is in the front of your ICD-10 manual. So, you know, one key thing I want to point out, when you get your coding books every year, most providers tend to do what? They open it up, they go to their sections, the sections that they use, and they just read those codes. The good information is in the front of the book and the back of the book. This is where you're going to get a lot of introductory, a lot of guidelines. And this year, what happened with 2022 is the guidelines themselves are making it mandatory that you have to use the highest number of characters that are available, but more specifically in section um, IB13, the guidelines say that unspecified side should be used only under very limited circumstances when clarification is not possible. So the big deal with this is this gives the carriers and out to deny codes when you're not using or specifically using the specified code that identifies the right or the left or bilateral. 
if we don't have a diagnosis code for bilateral and we're doing a service bilaterally, we know that we have to report um, the RT and the LT. So I say here, be very cautious uh, to make sure your specialist that you're using the codes to the highest degree of specificity. What else can happen if you use unspecified codes? Well, you get those very annoying audits that say, this is not an audit. But what we're going to do here is we want um, 250 charts because we want to check the diagnosis codes of your patients. The more unspecified diagnosis codes you use, the more you're going to get these types of audits. Because what the carrier has to do is to collect data and find out how that patient population is aging or you know how sick is this patient population and they need that information because they go back to Medicare this is for your um, Medicare managed care or your Advantage plans and that's how they get higher reimbursement or mon more money basically from Medicare to manage these types of patients so if you want to avoid those types of audits um, make sure you use your specified codes and just know that you're going to start to see denials from the payers if you're also using unspecified codes when they know there's laterality, you know, on it as well. Okay. So um, a few questions here. Let me just look into the chat. Okay, so I'm just going to go back. I did see another question to the split shared visits, and it says, if it's possible when a patient went to two different physicians for split shared visits, and the answer to that question is no. This is when you have a physician and you have a non-physician practitioner and both providers, both healthcare providers, are seeing the patient on the same day um, for a particular purpose, for like an E&M visit, where they go, go to the hospital, as I mentioned earlier, and maybe the, um, the NP or the PA does the history and the physical on the patient, and then the um, MD would come in and make the medical decision, review the information. So it, it's not when you have two different physicians. It's not for physician to physician. Okay, and we have another question here for the 66989. Let's go back to that. Okay, so for the 66989, um, the question is, hold on. Okay, when billing for the, um, the cataract with the MIG surgery, we would bill the 66989 and the 0671T. Okay, so it says here, this is your extra capsular cataract. This is for one or more. And then it says here, um, for insertion of an intraocular anterior segment drainage device, if you're doing this, uh, you would use the 0671T. So, yes. We have a question here about global days for the 67141 and the 67145. Okay, I don't unfortunately have global days um, in my mind, but if you go to that search on the physician search, you could find the global day splits for any of the CPT codes. And the same with the range of values for the RUC committee. Um, you can go actually um, online to the search and you can see where um, the slide before will give you that information or that guide and you can find out everything about how the RVUs are generated and what the range of values are. Okay, now we're going to take a look. at the evaluation and management changes, which came out in 2021. Uh, still a lot of questions about this. I know the AMA came in and they had a couple of updates. They had it in May of last year, September of last year. So they've been trying to clarify um, 
a lot of the questions that were coming in where there were some like gray areas. Additionally, uh, word on the street is that they're going to move to change the other ENM codes to this type of a format, uh, where it's really just based on the medical decision making for 2023. Um, that's what we hear, whether it happens or not, uh, we'll find out. Okay, so to be clear, these are only for outpatient services. And those of you who are seeing patients in a hospital setting, or you're seeing patients in a skilled nursing facility, or you're seeing patients in an emergency department, you still need to use the previous guidelines. Whether you were using the 1995 or the 1997 guidelines, that did not change. This is only for outpatient services, your office visit services. And this went into effect January 1 of last year. This is a nice table, and it kind of gives you a side-by-side -side view on how the uh, E&M services would be uh, selected. And again, clearly you can see the differences here for your other services, hospital observation, inpatient, consults. You're still going to use those key components. You're still going to do the 95 or 97. This is only for your outpatient. And we're going to talk about all these differences here as we go through the presentation. So the big change here is with how you determine the level of service. Now you can choose your level of service based upon either your medical decision making or based on time. But whichever you choose, the way we choose or the way we document time is very different than the way you were documenting time. And the way you document your medical decision is very different than the way you were documenting it for the 95 or 97 guidelines. So the first question you say is, well, okay, what happened to your history and physical exam if we're going to do this based upon the medical decision making? You still need to document an H and P but you're going to document your H&P as it's relevant to you as a clinician. Nobody's going to count how many review of systems you have. Nobody's going to count the HPI. We don't care how many body areas or organ systems you're examining. We don't care how many elements or for the eye exam you're documenting if you're using the 97. That's all left up to the clinician. So that's some good news there. Uh, 99201 has been deleted. The lowest level of new patient is now in 99202. No surprise there, nobody used this. Okay, so we're going to show you now how those changes are going to impact your documentation. First thing we notice and key things here, look at the problem. Right? What counts as a problem is anything that's noted or examined, evaluated, or treated at that encounter. So if you have comorbid conditions or the patient has comorbid conditions and you're not treating those conditions, you can certainly record them, document them, they're part of your management decision. However, you don't get credit in counting them towards a... Um, illness, disease, or injury when you count the number of diagnoses that you're treating or evaluating or managing at that encounter. And we, we have examples that we're going to put in here as well. Uh, in order, by the way, in order for that problem to be considered addressed or managed, it needs to be evaluated or treated. So we want to make sure that we see that um, some decision is made for that particular diagnosis code. Now here's the grid, all right? So the first thing that we notice is that we still have elements of medical decision-making. Those three elements are the number and complexity of problems, and notice here's those words again, addressed at the encounter. Now it's the amount and complexity of data to be reviewed and analyzed, but this changes now because we have unique tests, orders, or documentation that contributes to the combination of the categories. So this is the area that changed the most for your E&M codes. And risk. 
risk basically stayed the same but there's a couple of nuances as we look at those higher levels of service and we'll talk about that in a minute notice that your new and established patients are all grouped together so we don't need to document more or a higher level of documentation for a new patient as opposed to an established because it's simply based on the medical decision making and obviously this is going to be the level whether it's straightforward or low so let's start to take a look at what constitutes these problems so a straightforward problem is typically defined as something that uh, could kind of go away on itself or if you gave mom a call she can give you some um, advice um, it's something that's very self-limited or minor it doesn't require any diagnostic testing and the person is at minimal risk of morbidity and and basically like I said it's something that might heal by itself maybe um, you know it, it's conjunctivitis or red eye and just you know a warm compress will take care of the problem that's something that's straightforward low uh, you now need two or more self-limited or minor problems or one stable chronic illness or one acute uncomplicated illness or injury either of these will constitute low uh, for the number of complexity of problems addressed at the encounter now look at what constitutes limited for your data review now we have categories we have two categories within the data review and for it to be considered limited you have to meet at least one of these two categories and the first category is any combination of two of these bullet points and the bullet points are review of prior external notes from each unique source or review of the results of each unique test or ordering of each unique test so what defines a unique source a unique source is if the person were coming to you with medical records from their um, previous provider or maybe medical records from their primary care provider that's a unique source right it's coming from outside it's external but if they came to you with records from their primary care provider and they came to you with records from um, their recent hospital admission those are two points because now you have notes from the outside from two different sources the next is the review of results of each unique test what defines a unique test each CPT code is a unique um, test and the ordering of each unique test now this has a little bit of a caveat because you'll only get credit for ordering a unique test if you're not performing it yourself we're going to talk about that in more detail in just a little bit and we do scan in some notes because it makes more sense when you actually apply it to a note category two is an assessment that requires an independent historian so that's something that's new uh, from last year it's something that happens frequently because sometimes when you're taking the history from the patient it might be an elderly patient and um, they may be there with their husband or their son or their daughter and you might need to get that information from someone other than the patient because they're just not a reliable source they might not have a good memory um, they might have a bit of dementia might be a child you know that you just can't get the information from so it's either of these categories either you're going to get two points from category one or you have an independent historian and low risk of morbidity for this particular patient would be something like um, over-the-counter medication so to choose your level it's the best two of three elements okay so um, typically for ophthalmology because you're doing a lot of testing yourself you're not going to get a lot of credit here for the tests but you do a lot on multiple problems and the risk so we'll take a look as it goes forward okay and this just comes from the cpt assistant 
which just gives you more information about what is an uncomplicated illness or injury, what's a stable chronic illness. Um, so that's a lot of good information there. Okay, moderate level four. Remember, it's two or three columns here. So you can have one chronic illness that's exacerbating, not getting better, or maybe there's some side effect of treatment, or two or more stable chronic conditions, or one undiagnosed new problem with an uncertain prognosis. Maybe you're not going to diagnose this patient until you get some test results on them, so you're really not quite sure. Or an acute illness with systemic symptoms or an acute complicated injury. Now when we move to our data, notice we now have three categories, right? And you need to meet the requirements of at least one of these three categories. But the interesting thing here is your assessment that requires an independent historian is now part of category one when we move to moderate. So we still have the um, review of prior external notes, the review of the test results, the ordering of the unique test, and now they added in the independent historian because now you need three points from category one or independent interpretation of tests performed by another physician or QHP. So if the patient is coming to you and maybe they have um, a CD of an MRI or a CAT scan or you know some of those tests and you're going to look at those images and make your own interpretation this is where you would get credit. Category 3 is a discussion of management or test interpretation with an external physician so not somebody in your group but if you needed to pick up the phone and call another physician or qualified healthcare professional or appropriate source you would get credit in this category. Moderate risk is prescription drug management. So if you had someone who was um, a glaucoma and it's getting worse or exacerbated and you're treating them on prescription uh, drug management, that would be a four, whether it's a new or established patient. Decision regarding minor surgery with identified patient or procedure risk factors. A uh, decision regarding elective major surgery uh, without identified risk factors, and this is new. This is diagnosis or treatment significantly limited by social detriments of health. So what does that mean? Okay, well, social detriments of health. You have folks that are housing insecurity, food insecurity, um, low-level education, Right? These people are more challenging to treat um, than somebody who's not in that particular situation. And we're going to talk about that more. Uh, we have a whole list of the diagnosis codes and where to find them. But if your patient population falls into this, you're treating maybe a, a high group of Medicaid patients, uh, Medicaid HMO patients, and think about also from the pandemic, a lot of people got hit hard with food insecurity. If that's documented, that puts the patient at moderate risk. Keeping in mind that risk is only one of these three categories that you need because it's the best two out of three, okay? And that was one of the questions. What other examples would you consider to be moderate risk? So moderate risk, like I said, is easy for most because it's either prescription drug management. If you're gonna do some minor surgery and maybe this patient has some other risk factors, that would make it moderate risk, or an elective surgery where there are no risk factors and those social determinants of health. When we move to high, okay, these are your level fives, and we all know that the level fives come with that red flag warning. They do happen, um, not as frequently, but they do happen. This is someone with a severe illness, a severe exacerbation, or an acute chronic illness that's gonna pose a threat to um, life or limb or bodily harm. Now look at the amount of data you would need. The categories are the same as moderate, but now you have to meet the criteria of two of the three categories. And the high risk patient is someone with drug therapy requiring intensive monitoring uh, for toxicity, or that elective major surgery with 
risk factors or emergency major surgery maybe a decision to hospitalize the patient or do not resuscitate now the information in your handout i gave you all the information from the ama and i gave you the updates there's a lot of definitions that are in there that i believe are helpful so i do recommend reading them and obviously you want to start to take a look at those updates that they sent because it did clarify a lot of information that was in the first document and again this comes from the cpt assistant just to give you some ideas how you describe the problem is crucial i cannot stress this enough auditors are not clinical people okay so if you think your notes are being reviewed by rns or mds or mds or pas it's a rare situation so what do you want to do you know if these problems are acute uncomplicated self-limited use the language that best describes it so an auditor can understand it right so the best um, advice i can give you words like stable resolved improving right that's somebody who is you know a stable patient they're not at risk but if we see not improving severe complicated that kind of moves you into a whole different frame of mind that's more of a moderate case maybe the patient needs further follow-up if you're changing the medication for the patient obviously something is not working well right so this is a good list um, of favorite words to use to help the auditor understand the severity of that particular case all right and then this is a nice uh, kind of summary straightforward it's a self-limited problem it usually resolves on its own a low problem is something that's stable uncomplicated maybe it's just one single problem and uh, moderate multiple problems or somebody who's significantly ill and high is very ill and under moderate i would say someone who's significantly ill or really not improving as anticipated on your treatment plan okay so this is the audit tool everything that we just went over and we know it's the best two out of three so let's take a look at defining some more of the information that's in this complexity of data. Tests, anything imaging, laboratory, psychometric, or physiological data. But if you are ordering a test that you are performing, you're doing it in your office, you don't get credit for the test, right? Because the um, the way the guidelines work, if you're performing the test, you're doing the test, you're interpreting the test, you're getting paid separately for that. So they're not going to count that towards your, MA, your um, medical decision making. It would be like double dipping. So here's an example. A diabetic patient comes to the office with complaints of blurry vision and sensitivity to glare for the past month. Physician documents the appropriate H&P, or it is a fluorescein angiograph and um, ophthalmoscopy, okay? Uh, in this case, we have two unique tests, right? Each test is defined by its own CPT code, so we have two tests. But since both of these tests are being reported by the physician, no credit is given under the data elements on the MDM matrix because you're gonna get paid for those tests yourself. Okay, prior of ex review of prior external notes. So here we can see an example with the patients presenting with multiple pages of medical history, tests from their primary care physician. You would get credit for that. These external notes can come from any organization, a hospital, nursing facility, a home health care agency. Uh, you get home for that, uh, credit for that as well. And what do we mean by an external physician or qualified healthcare professional? These have to come from someone outside of your practice. When we talk about discussion of management or test interpretation, okay, what is an appropriate source? Well, here you don't just have to think about um, medical. Maybe you need to look at things from a case manager, for a teacher, if it's the little ones, or maybe a pharmacist. Uh, a lawyer, parole officer, 
it just does not include discussion with family or informal caregivers. And independent interpretation, I, I think we kind of spoke about that. It's when they're coming with images on their own that were taken outside of your practice, and you're going to form your own interpretation, you'll get credit for that. Um, the good news here is that you really didn't have to conform to a formal interpretation. You can just note in your chart what you feel would be um, appropriate of your findings, whatever you find. So it doesn't have to be a formal interpretation like a radiological report. It just needs to be um, your thought process on what you see. Independent historian, again, um, this is good because remember we saw that you get credit for this. This was one of those categories, uh, cases where there might be a conflict, poor communication, uh, multiple historians are needed to get a full description of what you need for that patient. Uh, you would want to note that. Uh, some of the EMRs you can just put down, um, you know, what was the special circumstance? Maybe it was a child, maybe the patient had dementia, dementia. you can have these as drop downs, and then who provided you with the history, right? Uh, this question I get all the time. If a patient doesn't speak English and the history is taken from a surrogate, does that qualify as an independent historian? And the answer is no, that's translation. So there are um, HICPIC codes. If you have a translator that you have to pay for, you use the language line or something of that nature, there's codes for that, but it's not getting history as an independent historian. That would just be uh, translation. Your social determinants of health. Okay, these are any economic or social conditions that are gonna impact um, the care for that particular patient. This falls under moderate risk. So remember, risk is just one of those uh, three key components of which you need two. And again, you can have a drop down. You know, food insecurity, housing insecurity, they're una unable to pay to come to the doctor, don't have copayment money, uh, no health insurance. And the risk elements, um, I think those are pretty straightforward. Uh, low, again, things uh, over the counter medication, Moderate, the most common, is the prescription drug management, or as we see now, the social detriments of health. And the high risk, obviously, you know, these people are either on their way to the uh, hospital or emergency department. Okay, so now that we understand the table and we understand the categories, and we know that it's the best two out of three, how do we put all of this together? Well. Remember we said over here, right, it's the best two or three elements. So for this particular patient that came in, we had one acute uncomplicated illness or injury. We didn't do any testing on them. We didn't need it. And we just gave them some over the medication, over the counter medication. So the best two out of three, this would be a level three, whether it's a new patient or an established patient. And by the way, you still need to meet the criteria for a new patient where they would um, have not had been seen uh, for the past three years and actually three years and one day by the same physician or physician of the same group practice. So here's a sample. Mrs. Smith comes with blurry vision for the past two months. It's worse in the right eye. Uh, doctor performs uh, the appropriate H&P, a SCOTI, a phlemoscopy. Uh, the diagnosis is documented as diabetic retinopathy without edema and glaucoma. Patients prescribes Lantoprost treatment and is to follow up in five to six weeks. And by the way, the testing here, I'm not a physician. I just pick some testing to get the points in here. So when we look at this, we see that... Um, there's one or more chronic illness with an exacerbation, right? She has blurry vision. It's getting worse. Um, although there were two tests that were done, because we're reporting those tests and getting paid for the test, it's going to be minimal or straightforward. But we did put the patient on prescription drug management. It's the best two out of three. So this was an established patient. It would be a 99214. 
Okay, here we see the patient is coming for a follow-up for dry eye syndrome. Again, we do the appropriate H and P. The diagnosis is documented as dry eye syndrome. They're doing well to those over-the-counter medications. Uh, continue to keep using it and come back in three months' time. So here we have a stable chronic illness. Again, no testing. And they're on some over-the-counter medication. It's the best two out of three. Uh, this would be a 99213. Okay, so that's how you do it on the medical decision, but what happens when we want to use time to determine the level of service? And here I want to do a caution note because, you know, the physicians, the QHPs, they're all trained, qualified, and skilled to make these high complex medical decisions in a relatively uh, short period of time. So if you're using time, you're probably going to see less patients than you are if you were using the medical decision making. And if you're using time, there's only 24 hours in a day and most people work anywhere from 8 to 10 hours a day. Um, you can very easily exceed that amount of time if you're using time for each and every one of your patients or you're limiting the amount of patients you could see based on time. But there will be some encounters where they more than likely will be just time-based encounters. So again, you know, we're going to see the alert. This is only for your outpatient services. And the way we document and can get credit for time is very different than the way we were getting for time before. So notice now it's the total time on the date of the encounter. It's not 50% or more counseling face to face because now it could be services that are done for that patient that are face to face and non face to face time. But it all has to be done on the same date of the encounter. It does not include clinical staff time. So the amount of time that's done whether it's face-to-face -face or non-face-to-face, -face, has to be done by the physician or the QHP. And um, it does notice, it, it does recognize a lot of non-face-to-face -face activities. So let's take a look at what's included in this time. Well, what about the time it takes you to prepare to see the patient? Maybe you want to review some test results, review their medical record before you call them into the office. Um, and again, on the same day. Obtaining or reviewing separately obtained history. The time it took you to do your H&P for the patient. Counseling and educating the patient or a family member or caregiver. Ordering medications. It's if you're doing this yourself, you're picking up the phone and calling the pharmacy or the testing facility, right? Or you're gonna call and communicate with other um, healthcare professionals. Look at what else you get credit for. The time it takes you to document the clinical information in the electronic or other healthcare record. Um, independently interpreting those test results. Remember now we're not using the MDM. Uh, so the time it takes you to look at those images and come up with your analysis can be counted. And any care coordination. Now the time elements have changed, right? So not so much for your um, new patients. Your 99202 was 20 minutes, but now 15 minutes to 29 minutes would give you a 99202. For your 203, 204, 205, the times basically the minimal amount of time stayed the same. But when we move to our established patients, the first thing that we notice is there is no time component for your 99211, but your 99212 stayed the same. You got your 10 minutes. When we look at our 99213, 99214, and 99215, you can see that now our time difference has changed. What used to be 15 minutes for a level three is now 20. What used to be 25 minutes for a four starts at 30. And your 99215 basically stayed the same with the minimal amount to be 40 minutes. 
so you can see you know you'll probably see more patients based on the MDM as opposed to time so what do we have for a case study here well maybe the patient is coming in they have a lot of side effects from their prescription medication doctor does his H&P uh, understands the patient now has multiple allergies to the various medications and he decides to do some research maybe he's looking up in some um, the books to see what the patient could use but then decides let me call the pharmacist and see what we can come up with so a total of 35 minutes was spent encompassing seeing the patient researching the meds discussing with the pharmacist and documenting the encounter you get credit for all of those times including documenting the encounter so that 35 minutes would get you a 99214 and notice you know, you're going to have your H&P up here, but then, you know, there's these one or two sentences that basically summarize the encounter and what you spent on the time is sufficient enough to get that um, code used. We also have uh, prolonged attendance codes. And oftentimes what happens is Medicare does not agree with the definitions in CPT, so they come up with their own codes. So we do have a prolonged service code. Again, this is for outpatient, right? And that's beyond that minimum required time. So the only time you're going to append these prolonged service codes is once you hit that highest level of time. So either a 99205 or a 99215 uh, for your outpatient services. And this is billed in increments of each 15 minutes. For Medicare, it's G2212, and again, you have to hit the highest amount of time first. And the only difference really between the two codes is that Medicare wanted to put in that these codes, these prolonged service codes, cannot be reported with this other subset of codes or cannot be reported for any time unit less than 15 minutes. So your handout has all of this um, information. It has the documentation guidelines from the AMA. Um, it has some really great links here and websites you can go to. I also gave you the updates and the clarification from the AMA. So if anybody has any questions on the level of service, I'll just give you a second to put that into the chat. Okay, so nothing there for the e and &M. And now we're going to talk a little bit more about those social detriments of health because we did see that that does give you moderate risk for these patients. Um, you know, this information actually helps. They're starting to collect a lot of this data. We had a fair amount of diagnosis codes for this in the past, but in 2022, it really greatly um, increased. So these are people who have unmet social needs, but that has a very negative impact on their health. And as I mentioned, food insecurity, housing instability, transportation barriers, right? They just can't make it to the doctor's office. And this is some of the impacts. So you'll notice that these impacts here are all translated into um, the CPT codes. And these are categories so they would all need additional um, characters, but you see problems related to education and literacy. Think about how long it takes you to explain some of these um, treatment options and treatment plans to patients, people that have unemployment, um, occupational risks. So there's a whole wealth in the Z section of your ICD-10 manual that you could take a look at to see if your patients fall into those categories. Okay, so now we're back to our I codes versus the E and M. Well, which do you use? So, you know, while the I codes are much simpler to understand and easier to use, they're not all inclusive. So, patients with a severe situation occurring, it might not be appropriate to use an I code. Additionally, most exams fit within the requirements, but not all of them. Complex patients require complex care. So that might speak more to e and m think if it's a medical problem more likely you're going to be using your e and m codes if it's more of um, an eye check code 
uh, you're probably better off using your iCodes. The, some of the differences with the iCodes is that um, some carriers limit the amount of iCodes the patient can have within a year depending on their policy. But from an auditing perspective, and I've been doing this for over 30 years, very seldom are the iCodes audited. Okay, so what's in common and what's different? So a lot of physicians look for a definitive answer. Well, what should I use? Just tell me, what should I use? Some use an E&M for the first visit and the iCodes for follow-up. Some use a comprehensive iCode to be followed up by an E&M. It really depends on your patients, your patient population, and the reason for the visit. So the choice is yours. But things to consider. Why is the patient here? Are they coming for medical? Uh, for treatment of glaucoma, uh, there, those cases E&M would be more applicable. Or is it something that's really just vision related, someone with low vision, and maybe they have no medical issues, then those eye codes would be more applicable. Uh, the type of exam provided, it's going to be based upon uh, whether you're using the eye codes. And again, notice if you're using your E&M codes, that physical exam is left up to your discretion. Uh, and carrier requirements. As I mentioned earlier, some of the carriers limit the number of I-codes that could be reported. In any event, whether you're using an I-code or an E&M code, the documentation has to support all of those requirements. So we know what's required for the E&M, right? But unlike the E&M coding guidelines, I exams don't specify required history elements. The guidelines just say medical history, and that's left up to um, the clinician to determine what it is they want to document. But it's expected that that history is going to be relative to um, the patient's overall health and those presenting conditions. Maybe some patients might require a more detailed history. Uh, those that would have either multiple problems or complex issues, maybe there you want to take a little bit more in-depth history or maybe something that's just more focused for patients that are healthy. So what is a general, we see on this um, slide here, we highlight, and this is where a lot of providers tend to go wrong, you know, what's a general medical observation? Uh, what do I need to document for that? Well, that refers to any documentation that describes the patient's overall systemic health or maybe their general constitution. Uh, maybe the patient you know, says that they're healthy or the patient has diabetes that's well controlled, things of that nature. And the initiation of diagnostic and treatment programs, according to CPT, that would be things like the prescription of medication, or maybe arranging for some um, diagnostic or treatment services for the patient, consults, laboratory procedures, uh, things of that nature. Uh, let's see, in a practice, a diagnostic program could be ordering or performing any diagnostic test that's not part of your eye exam. Think things like visual fields, scanning lasers, um, checking your visual acuity or measuring your IOP, or a slip lamp exam uh, would not fit in. So these are the elements that are required. One piece of documentation that's often missing in the eye exams um, for 92004 or 92014 is that general medical observation. Believe it or not, it's, it's that one thing that can um, make it go wrong. These are the exam re requirements, but on the previous screen, remember we saw that you needed to have that general medical observation. So you want to remember to document that. Now, CPT definition, and when you open up your CPT manual, don't just look at the codes, look at the guidelines that are before the codes, and that's where you're going to get all this information, because typically that's where providers get tripped up, right? You think you're doing a good job, you're focusing on what you need to do, and yet there's that, the devil's in the detail, there's that one little detail that's in the guidelines that's missing. So for a comprehensive um, ophthalmological service, CPT says it often includes, as indicated, biomicroscopy examination, 
with cycloplegia or mydrasis and tonometry. The words often includes in the definition for the 92004 and the 92014 means it may or may not be included. So just keep that in mind because sometimes the um, carriers, when they deny claims, they can deny it for these reasons, but very specifically CPT says that it just says often includes, it doesn't say that you must include as opposed to the general medical observation, which is in the guidelines as it includes. So anything that's included in those guidelines, you have to document. Things that say often includes, may include, that's at the clinician's discretion. So again, it's those little details that can um, trip you up. Again, the definition of 92004 and 92014, the doctor must document an ophthalmoscopic examination. However, um, a DFE is optional. So even though you're coding and billing those comprehensives, it doesn't require a DFE. I would say to still consider doing it um, as essential unless it's contraindicated. So it is a gold standard for the eye examination. And the only reason I mention this is because in malpractice cases, this often comes up. Was a DFE done? So I leave that up to the clinician. And this is where CPT and medical often um, butt heads or don't agree. So that's just something to consider. Oh, so here we just got a good question. For comprehensive eye exams, do you ever consider the physician recommending over-the-counter eye drugs or vitamins as initiating a treatment program? Yeah, that over-the-counter, whatever you're um, ordering or it's in your management decision, that over-the-counter definitely counts as uh, initiating a treatment plan because that's your medical decision. So, yes. Okay, so any other questions on the I codes before we move on to our modifiers? Now, this is interesting because this year alone, our office has gotten flooded with um, audits for the inappropriate use of modifiers. So let's see if we can help to clarify that. First of all, in the name of all things holy, not everything requires a modifier. So a lot of providers feel, well, you know, or bill is, I'll just put a 25 or a 59 or, you know, let me just put a modifier on this and, you know, no harm, no foul. Not true. The more you misuse modifiers, the faster it is going to get you on the carrier's radar screen. The carriers do data mining. So they're just going to run numbers. They're going to put an algorithm into the system. And usually they say, let me see all these providers that use modifier 25 and 59, or maybe modifier 50, you know, in great volume. And when this comes up, they cast a, a wide net, and then they get a lot of providers and they say, well, let's take a look and see if they're doing it right. So be careful, apply them when you really need them. They, we have two levels of modifiers within our coding system. Level one are CPT modifiers, they come by the AMA, and level two are HICPIC modifiers, um, Healthcare Common Procedural Coding System. These are developed by CMS. Now, you know, some carriers want you to use the CPT, some carriers want you to use the HICPICs, so you have to be careful and know your payers and know what they want because that's how their systems are set to pay. In some cases, you know, CMS wants it one way, your carrier wants it, maybe your Blue Cross or Blue Shield wants it another. So be cautious to make sure that you're putting your modifier assignment based upon the carrier's rules and regs. And again, that's because that's how their systems are set up to pay properly. So let's start with modifier 22. Uh, the full definition is on the screen, but modifier 22 is an increased procedural service. So for example, maybe during a cataract surgery, a tear develops in the posterior segment, and that allows that retinal material into the posterior lens. So that tear is gonna make that procedure more complicated 
and it's going to take longer to complete that procedure than what normally would be done if everything goes well. So these are examples of modifier 22. Something happens during the procedure that's going to take more time, more effort, more skill. Those are things you need to think about uh, for modifier 22. Modifier 22 is used with the procedure code and not an ENM code. Certain modifiers are applicable only to certain types of CPT codes, okay? And modifier 22 can be reported only with procedures with global periods of, of 0, 10, or 90 days. Think things like extra work, extra time, complex procedure, and it's used for unusual operative cases. Always submit the operative report and the documentation. All of these words need to be very clear in your documentation. What was the extra work? What was the amount of time? Um, you know, what was the problem? Why was this complex? What went wrong? And the operative report, any, any supporting documentation to prove the increased work or complexity of the procedure should be sent. Okay, red flag. It's anticipated that this happens. It's also um, not anticipated that this happens on every surgical procedure that is done. So use it appropriately as you need to use it. Uh, modifier 24, uh, this is an unrelated E&M by the same physician during a post-operative period. Uh, typically, I see this a lot. Modifier 24 is most often used during the 90-day global period, uh, maybe for cataract surgeries, and you're seeing something that is unrelated, right? So the service that's happening here in this post-op period has nothing to do with that particular surgery. And this modifier is appended only with E&M services. And again, it has to be unrelated to that original procedure. So we know that patients are requested to return during the post-op period for the eye exam that's related to the original surgical procedure. However, there are times when the patient may need to be seen for something unrelated uh, that would require the E&M code. Okay, so keywords here about modifier 24, it's unrelated, it's done by the same physician, and it's done from a post-operative period, but that post-operative period can carry, uh, can vary from carrier to carrier. Most of them now are using Medicare. I, I know that um, when Emblem Health was GHI, they kind of had their own post-op period, but by now they all came on board. You have your zero, you have your 10, you have your 90. It's pretty standard. Okay, this modifier doesn't increase or decrease reimbursement. It just gets the E&M service done. It bypasses those edits. And again, if modifier 24 is used uh, frequently, you can get on the carrier's radar screen. Modifier 25. Okay, so modifier 25 is probably one of the most misunderstood modifiers out there. This is a significant, separately identifiable E&M service by the same physician on the same day of a procedure or other services. If you make the decision today to have the patient come back next week for an injection or a surgical procedure, when they come back next week, they don't get another E&M. That decision, that evaluation and management decision was made previously. So it would be like getting paid to make the same decision twice, right? You're going to do some sort of a check on that patient before you give them that injection. You're going to do some uh, check on that patient before you do your operative procedure. And they know that. And inherent in that code for any surgical procedure is that pre-op work that's normally done, okay? To check that patient before you do it. So it's not like you're being um, slighted the money to check that patient, to do that cursory check. They've 
considered that value, remember we were talking about values earlier on, when the rough came up with the number to value these surgical procedures included in all of those surgical procedures is the value to check the patient on that same day. So this truly has to be something that's significant and separately identifiable. Okay. So this is um, modifier 25 is only used for a decision for surgery made on the same day as a minor or surgical procedure. If the patient comes today and today you're making that decision to do the injection, yes, you can get the injection and you can get the E&M as long as the note is documented appropriately. Remember significant and separately reportable for both services. And let's say they come today, you make the decision to give them the injection, but they need to come back next week for another one. When they come back next week, there is no E&M because again, you made that decision and you got paid for it. Overuse of this modifier is targeted not just by the insurance companies, but by the OIG, the, Offer of Ins the Office of Inspector General. And trust me, you don't wanna be down that road, okay? This is always appended to the E&M code and you have to make sure you're meeting the criteria for both that procedure and both the E&M if it's done on the same day for a minor procedure, which has a zero to 10 global. Okay. Modifier 25 is not used when you have a 90 day global. Okay, that would be decision to perform a major surgery. So we wouldn't use it there. All right, and again, it's always going to the E&M service. You wanna make sure you have the right uh, diagnosis linkage, you know, particularly if it's um, going to be an E&M and an additional surgical um, service or procedure. Modifier 26, the professional component, this is kind of pretty straightforward. A certain diagnostic test or a combination of a professional and technical component when just the professional component is reported separately, the service might be identified by using modifier 26 to the procedure code. And procedures for with this modifier can be used or identified on that Medicare fee schedule. So if you're doing some uh, surgical procedures in the hospital and maybe you're using radiological guidance, uh, your professional component can be billed with 26 and the hospital would be billing with TC for the technical component. Um, modifier 26 might be used for the interpretation only of fluorescein slides or visual fields sent to you by another physician for evaluation. And again, only if that patient um, wasn't seen. So 26 goes to a procedure or a service, it, 26 does not go to a, um, an E&M code. And again, this is the technical piece of it. That's what the hospital will, will build because they wanna get paid for the use of their tech and the use of their equipment. Now we're gonna come to the trouble modifier. And I call it the trouble modifier because we have been getting so many audits uh, for misuse of, of modifier 50. So unless otherwise identified, uh, bilateral procedures that are performed at the same operative session should be identified by adding modifier 50 to the appropriate five digit code. This is not used with codes whose descriptors clearly state bilateral or unilateral, right? And modifier 50 means that the service was performed on both sides of the body at the same operative session. You must, and I stress, you must check with your individual carriers because use of modifier 50 will vary from carrier to carrier on how they want these to be reported on one claim line or two claim lines on your CMS 1500 claim form. And this is the bilateral status indicators. So if you could remember early on when we were looking at the values to the Medicare fee schedule. Remember I pointed out one of those values was a bilateral indicator. 
And each of those indicators means something. And zero, if it has a bilateral indicator, zero, it means that bilateral surgery rules do, do not apply. So you couldn't use a bilateral indicator on any of these codes. Um, and by the way, all CPT codes have this indicator, and that determines how you're going to bill and how they're going to get reimbursed. A bilateral indicator of one, practitioners that are report the procedures performed bilaterally on one claim line with modifier 50, with one unit. Failure to report bilateral procedures in this way may result in incorrect processing of claims, which I see is happening with a lot of the payers right now. And when you report this on one claim line with modifier 50, you should receive 150% payment for the bilateral procedure. So that's what's built into their system. If you were to report these um, bilateral indicator one procedures with an LT or an RT, and one unit of service, okay, it's going to result in an incorrect payment. If you report this with um, on two claim lines, right, you take the same CPT code, you put modifier 50 on it, and you're billing it on two claim lines at one unit each, you're going to end up with um, improper reimbursement. The carriers are going to overpay you. And then what happens is the carrier comes back and they want to take this money back. And then you say, well, you paid me wrong. This is your problem. You paid me incorrectly. And New York State does have a law um, where I believe it's 18 months. They can only go back 18 or 20 for a month to collect the money. But if these are Medicaid HMOs, they can go back as far as they need to because that's state and funded money. So um, if it's a commercial carrier, Depending on the product, you might say, well, you can only go back so far, but I've seen some pretty hefty um, paybacks for inappropriate use of the modifier. So if you were to report these um, with indicator one with an LT and RT and one unit of service, okay, uh, that's appropriate only if the procedure is being performed unilaterally. If the procedure is performed bilaterally, you should use modifier 50. So you would only use your LT or your RT if you're just doing it unilaterally. Um, a bilateral indicator of three will tell you that you're going to use an LT or an RT with one unit of service for each. And bilateral indicator of nine just means that the concept doesn't apply. And they should not be billed with a 50, an LT, or an RT. Now, where do you get this information from? Well, again, it's the Medicare fee schedule, right? So here we can see a 67312, this is strabismus surgery, um, and a 67311. Both codes have a bilateral status modifier of one, bilateral procedures. So that means that we would report each of these if this, these were both done bilaterally Right? We're going to report them once with modifier 50 with one unit, and each of these should pay out at 150 of the fee schedule. You also need to take into consideration the MUE, which are your medical unlikely units. And here again, we get this from the Medicare fee schedule, and it means that each of these codes, the 67311 and the 67312, have an indicator of two service edits. So this can only be billed twice. This particular code can only be twice billed twice on the um, one date of service. So not only do you have the bilateral procedure indicator, you have your MUE edits as well that you need to look at. And that's why I'm saying those earlier slides that we first went over, every year, the best advice I can give you is download the full Medicare fee schedule. Look at things like surgery assist, look at things like modifiers, look at things like your MUE. This is where you're going to get the full story on how to build your codes. Okay, so 67312, that's performed in both eyes, and 67311, oh, sorry, this has a typo, this should be 67311 in both eyes, 
would be reported with the 67312, which is the higher payer of the fee schedule with modifier 50 on one line, one unit, 67311, modifier 50, and modifier 51 for the multiple surgery um, reduction. Okay, modifier 51 is, this is probably one of the easier ones. This is where we have multiple procedures. Uh, you would apply modifier 50 to that second and the additional procedure service codes. Um, it's not appended to any add-on codes, so you would never put a 51 to any service that's an add-on code. Um, it's appended to each additional procedure performed after the first procedure. So the first procedure does not need 51. And additionally, there are certain codes that are modifier 51 exempt, where you would not need to report the 51. And, you know, I have to say, there's no worries really so much with this because most of the payers, their systems are all set up to understand, you know, when there's multiple procedures, trust me that they will reduce your reimbursement. Okay. Um, I want to get to the effect on payment. Here we go. So you'll get 100% of the payment schedule for the procedure with the highest payment. You want to make sure you list that first because then you're going to get 50% of the payment for the second through the fifth procedures. If you have more than five procedures, anything beyond that fifth procedure would be reported um, or reimbursed by report, meaning that they would want to take a look at that operative report and um, then they'll determine based upon what's in that report how much they're going to pay. Okay, modifier 52 is reduced services. So in certain circumstances, for various reasons, a procedure is either partially reduced or eliminated, and this is at the physician's discretion. So um, this should be used, maybe a, a good example would be when a diagnostic test is designated as having a bilateral surgery indicator of two. Um, so current examples of this would be your fundus photography, a 92250. If you're performing that only under one eye, um, you would then use your modifier 52 reduced services. Goinoscopy would be another one, a 92020. Those are just definitions. Okay, so basically this code is used when the service was not completed to the full extent of the code descriptor. So that's another important thing to look for. Read your CPT code descriptors. Remember we were talking before about what's included in the comprehensive visit. Uh, so if your comprehensive visit doesn't include some of those elements, you could still build a comprehensive visit, but with modifier 52 to show it was reduced. You would not use this modifier for any procedure that was terminated. That's different. Okay, when you're documenting for modifier 52, if there are certain circumstances to surround why the um, service was reduced, maybe the patient only had one eye, that would be in there. That would be 52 on something that is um, inherently bilateral. Modifier 53 is a discontinued procedure, not a reduced, but a discontinued procedure. So typically what we find sometimes, you know, you start a surgical procedure and something happens, um, the patient's pressure may go up, or whatever the cause may be. There's a need determined by the physician, um, and this could be diagnostic as well, diagnostic or surgical um, there's a need by the physician to discontinue or stop that procedure for the well-being of the patient. And again, this is just the descriptor. Okay, so this is used when that procedure was started but discontinued. And that's again at the physician's discretion, so we'd want to see that documentation. Um, and again, you know, you want to document to the fullest extent of what you were able to do for that particular procedure or diagnostic test because they're going to reduce it based upon how much or how little work you did. Okay, 53 is not used with an E&M code. 
Um, it's not used for elective cancel cancellations of procedures before the patient's anesthesia uh, was done or preparing the patient in the operating room or when a procedure is changed to a more extensive procedure. So if you started a lesser procedure and you finished off with something more extensive, obviously you would just build that more extensive procedure. This is a nice side-by-side, -side, and it basically will show you, you know, 52 um, reduced at the physician's discretion, 53, again, it's the physician's determination, but this is due to some life-threatening condition that required you the need to terminate that procedure. 57 is that E&M service that results in the decision to perform a major surgery. And this is always added to the um, E&M code. CMS defines a major surgery as a procedure that has a global of 90 days. Minor surgeries, um, remember we discussed them before, um, those zero to 10 days or any endoscopies, you would not use the 57 modifier, that would be the 25. And preoperative period is defined as the day before and the day of the surgical procedure. So if you're seeing the patient today, you're going to do a major surgery tomorrow. In order to get paid for that e &M, you would have to append 57 to your e &M code um, for today. Or if you're going to see the patient today and go ahead and do that major surgery today, that e &M would need the 57. So here's some tips on um, when to use the 57. 59 is another one of those modifiers that um, are, are misinterpreted. A lot of people feel, well, okay, I'm doing multiple tests today, I'm just gonna put a 59 on all of them and no harm. Uh, we do know what the harm is now, so you do want to um, make sure that you're using modifier 59 appropriately. Modifier 59 speaks to something that's done at a different session, a different procedure or surgery, a different site or organ system. Maybe you're making a separate incision or excision on the same anatomical um, area or a separate uh, injury or area of injury where you have some extensive um, injuries occurring. There's also the X modifiers, okay? Um, Notice that on this slide here, we're defining all the different reasons why modifier 59 can be used, but a couple of years back, um, CMS came out with the X modifiers, and these speak to each individual reason as to why modifier 59 was used. So again, carry your discretion to use either the 59 or the XE modifiers, but these are more specific. Um, over here. So these are the four subsets of modifiers because modifier 59 was very broadly applied. Now we have the subset that's going to break it down. Okay, so um, the XE is that separate encounter. Um, as an example, a patient could be examined in a multi-specialty practice for cataract follow-up but later that day gets hit in the eye and experiences floaters that results in a subsequent examination by the retina specialist for a potential retina detachment. So typically Medicare and the other payers are not gonna pay for multiple visits by different physicians in the same practice on the same day, but by using modifier 59 or XE, um, that should get the job done. The XS, a separate structure, um, that was done on a separate organ or a different structure. So you can look through these, and again, these are carrier specific. Um, so some of them still want the uh, 59, some of them will take the X modifiers. Modifier 93, this is new for this year. We didn't touch on telehealth. Um, and I also want you to be aware that um, the pandemic is coming to, thankfully, coming to somewhat of a close. So a lot of those waivers that we've been used to um, a lot of those modifiers that we've been used to or waivers that we've been used to are, will now no longer be. But they did come out with some new modifiers. I do believe that a lot of the um, 
telehealth codes are gonna stay. they've they've been working well. i haven't heard anything that the carriers are starting to decrease that but modifier ninety three is new for this year this is a telephone or real time interactive audio only telecommunication system. key words here audio only so any time you're doing some sort of a telemedicine service only by phone uh, not audio visual modifier 93 will apply we haven't really gotten a lot of guidance from the payers on when they're going to accept this modifier or not i haven't seen anything from cms about modifier 93 uh, maybe the max I, I mean i went on to national government services i'm here in new york i haven't seen anything so far so i would say just um, take a look at that and check with your payers what they want you to do there's a new place of service code uh, 10 and there's a new definition for place of service uh, 2. so this would be effective with claim dates on and after april 4th of 2022 uh, cms will put this into effect and here's your descriptors uh, place of service 02 is telehealth provided other than in the patient's home and that's the location where the health services and health related services are provided or received through telecommunication technology um, and place of service 10 is telehealth provided in the patient's home uh, key things that I want to point out we're starting to see a lot of audits come in um, for the telehealth just please please make sure of a couple of things that you do have some sort of consent on file be it verbal consent that the patient was consenting to have services done via telehealth be it audio visual and if you're doing something audio visual please make sure that you have the platform documented because only certain ones are hipaa compliant um, so you want to make sure that you're meeting that criteria as well. That's what we're starting to see um, the carriers come back with. One other thing I do want to mention kind of as a caution, you know, to, to be aware of is that um, I'm getting a lot of audits for ophthalmologists that are doing transcranial Dopplers. And those are very high ticket items and the give backs or the reimbursements are very high. So I say that if um, you're doing transcranial Dopplers or if reps come in, you know, talking about transcranial Dopplers, make sure you look at your Medicare local coverage determination first because the diagnosis codes are very, very limited for those services. And they tend to do with folks that have um, stenosis so things like diabetes and hypertension and some of these eye conditions glaucoma whatever on their own will not get these paid because it just doesn't support medical necessity so um, just i would say go online download those uh, lcds and articles and you can take a look and be cautious so i have a few minutes here i will check the chat box and what I'm going to do is, uh, if I don't have time to answer all these questions, um, maybe Richard or Colleen uh, can get me a list of these questions and the emails of which I can respond them to. And I'll be happy to get back to you uh, via email. So if you just give me a second here, I'm just going to look through. Jackie, we can definitely do that. We can put them all into one document and send it to you. You can answer the questions and we'll send it out to the group. Okay, so it, it's just about five o'clock on my end here. I just want to, you know, I'll, I'll answer a few of them while I can, but I want to assure everybody that whatever question you have, I will, um, you know, be more than happy to get back to you via email. So we have one of the questions here. This looks like it's an E&M question. If a doctor sees a patient and builds an E&M, and then the patient comes back the same um, for the same medical diagnosis two or three more times with the same diagnosis, does the doctor have to use the E&M exam code for those exams since billing with the same medical or different diagnosis? So I take this question, or the way I interpret this test, uh, question is that the patient comes in today and maybe they have um, glaucoma 
and they're going to come back maybe a week or two weeks and they're going to follow up for the glaucoma. Um, do you have to use the same E&M code for those exams with the same medical or different diagnosis? Well, the diagnosis you would use would be the diagnosis that you're treating the patient for. And when you say exam or E&M code, the code is going to be different, remember, based upon the status of the patient. So if the patient's not improving and you need to change their treatment plan or their prescription medication, that's somebody that's at moderate complexity. But if the patient's coming back and everything is fine, everything is stable, um, they're even fine with the prescription medication, everything's working well, that would be low because the condition of the patient is going to be low and it's the best two out of three. So on those particular patients, uh, it's just gonna come down to what the status of their diagnosis is and what your management treatment is. And let's see if I can do one more here. Okay, uh, this is really a good question. Uh, we have found a few claims denying with medical diagnosis with an eye exam code. Is it okay to rebuild an E&M code, a corrected claim, or will this be a red flag for an audit, et cetera? Um, Okay, so it's based on the documentation. So if you build this claim out um, and it was an eye exam code and you had a medical diagnosis and it was denied for such and the documentation actually supports the documentation for an E&M at whatever level you know, it happens to be, you can go ahead and you could do a corrected claim and bill it out that way. The second part of the question, will it be a red flag uh, for an audit? Probably not. And the reason I say that is because corrected claims go to one department and the SIU, a special investigation unit, uh, they have a totally different area. And these companies are so big, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. But this is basically going to come down to the documentation that you have in your notes. So as long as the documentation supports an E&M and has that medical diagnosis, everything should be fine. And let's see, I have one more here. Okay. And this one is speaking to, uh, let's see, the primary diagnosis on the office visit. I just want to scroll down here. Okay, good question. Does the primary diagnosis on the office visit and procedure need to be different when using modifier 25? The answer is no. CPT is very clear on that. It can be for the same diagnosis. The keywords is that it's significant and separately identifiable. So remember we said a lot of these procedures and services include that, that pre-op or that check that you're going to do for that patient, but sometimes you don't know that you're going to do a procedure uh, for that patient when they come in and on that day that you're doing your exam you're going to go ahead do your initial evaluation your h and p and then ultimately your medical decision will be to go ahead and do that injection or do that procedure as long as it supports enough information to meet the criteria of an e and m even though the diagnosis is the same you can append modifier 25. so on that note I will thank everybody for attending, uh, particularly on a Friday late in the afternoon when I'm sure everybody would um, much rather try to be out of the office a little early. I do appreciate that, and I will make sure that I get back to each and every one of your questions. Um, so thank you for attending, and I'm going to sign off and have a pleasant day and turn it back over to Richard. Thank you all for attending and have a great evening.